taking picture all over at the end of the session. So today we are very grateful to have such remarkable judges with us. Allow me to proudly present our judges. We have Mr. Shak Sharul, uh, the director at United Nations Global Compact Network Malaysia, UNGCMYB, board member of and he also a board member of Aleka Sediam Bahai. Welcome, Mr. Shaksharo. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you. And our second judge is we have we have Ms. Felicia Chu, the head of human resource at Someway Integrated Properties. Welcome, Ms. Felicia. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Okay. Thank you so much. So before we start, I'm going to give a little bit reminder to all of the groups and participants. Groups are reminded that the presentation is allocated only up to 10 minutes. Five minutes for Q&A section from the judges and audience. And another last five minutes is the judges feedback. The time will be taken soon versus out. Last but not least, before we begin today, the teams are reminded that the slide presented must be similar as submitted to us earlier. If we find any changes made, the group will be disqualified. So without further ado, allow me to call the first group of the day. Group one, the floor is yours. Okay. I'm Yan Ru, the IGP of the PDRM, and I will be presenting the problem statement regarding unequal fine imposition. This problem arose from unfair fine treatment given to a worker hawker seller. I representing PDRM would like to first and foremost apologize to the worker hawker who has suffered as a result of this. Problem statement. Compound issues should be proportionate to the gravity of the breach. However, the current policy is highly retributive in nature, with room for excessive discretion. Therefore, we seek to introduce a more coherent guideline in the imposition of fines that emphasizes on distributive justice. So what are the issues? We are concerned the case where police officer A had issued a fine of 50,000 ringgit to Burger Hawker for operating past 10 p.m. during MCO due to receiving a complaint that the Burger Hawker was preparing burgers for takeaway orders past a lot of time. Two police officers who disagree with each other pertaining to the issuance of a fine made by one of the police officers. Police officer B disagree with the actions of police officer A that heartlessly issued a large amount of fine to the burger hawker who is surviving financially, hence receiving public backlash. After careful and thorough analysis of issues at hand, our perspective is that the primary purpose of the legislation in place is to prevent proliferation of disease as well as to save lives. This particular legislation is not meant to mirror the criminal or other branches of law that's punitive in nature and instead was drafted to address the COVID-19 calamity and control the outbreak. The law and its implementation should be fair, not arbitrary, focusing on achieving the goal of controlling the outbreak as opposed to punishing and abusing the general public. In essence, it's distributive in nature and not retributive. In our context, this means when a fine is imposed, it should be treated not as an equal imposition, but one of the equative in nature, meaning by paying heed to the gravity of the offense, primarily as well as the economical background and needs of the offender. The following are the solutions or ways to mitigate ambiguity in order to prevent dispute between officers and provide direction in the enactment of public duty. The first would be, in order to find someone, the police officer should have concrete evidence and not impose fines merely on grounds of hearsay or word of mouth. If people file complaints, it cannot be the primary evidence. Police officers need to be there to witness the breach of law as opposed to what Officer A did without proper visual confirmation. The second would be that the inspector can issue this guideline it's technically not part of the legislation or an amendment of it, but mere guidelines as to the manner of implementation of the state acts of parliament. The amount of fines should be justifiable. 
their primary and secondary factors, then the police officer should take note of in the guidelines that we provide. The primary factors of issuing a fine should fall under the severity of the offense. For example, how this one act which breaches the law has a high potential risk of infection or has a negative impact to the community in regards to COVID-19. On the other hand, the officer should also take note of the secondary factors, for example, the nature of business, timing of breach, geography, location, etc. And now I would like to pass to the deputy IGP led who is in charge of the formulation of guidelines. Hello, now I will present the um, guidelines to all of you. After consultation with the public and feedback from various credible organizations, we've constructed a guideline in regards to the primary factor discussed, which is severity of the offense. The first category, you know, it's, it's, it's distinguished between three different categories, first, second, and third. For first category, offenses resulting in high infection risk and significant impact to the community on a large scale. For the second category, offenses resulting in high infection risk but less significant impact to the community. As for the third category, offenses resulting in low infection risk and zero impact to the community. We will elaborate more on this part, especially as a breach by the burger hawker, we feel as a PDRM falls under this category. We think that the officer should have given the, um, the burger hawker a first warning instead of any fine imposition. To elaborate, first offender should be given a warning. Second offender will receive a fine of 10,000 ringgit to 14,999 ringgit or community service. And the third offender will be receiving a fine of 10,000 ringgit to 29,999 ringgit or an extended community service. The community service that we mentioned is related to COVID-19 as we feel that um, the the fine uh, abusers or the ones that breach the, the law can contribute to the pandemic and it, because there is a dire need for volunteers to handle the pandemic as well. So to emphasize, this is not the law. However, it is a guideline for the police officers. Therefore, this will help to resolve any disputes between different opinions with clearer direction and easier discretion by the police officer. Okay, moving on. Okay, furthermore, we understand the frustration due to unequal treatment and lack of transparency in regards to the imposition of fines. Hence, we will be taking action to implement and improve certain initiatives in order to better serve the public. Firstly, we'll, also, we'll be introducing workshops and educating our officers to better and more justly give fines according to good judgment. Secondly, audit or internal reference check. We will be, uh, we will be uh, um, starting this initiative to have internal checks from supervisors or officers in charge to monitor if the imposition of fines being done accordingly and justly. Next, to make sure that there is a seamless appeal process so that citizens can easily appeal for certain fines that they get and we can also educate the citizens of how to appeal this and lastly is to spread awareness about compound discount that was given that can be that can be given by the health department as many are still unaware and this will help people to really appreciate the government's effort to save and to to make sure that everyone is given a fair treatment I just want to point out a quote by Mr. Takiuddin Hassan, once said that the health ministry and the police have also instructed their officers to only issue fines as a last resort. This goes hand in hand with our push towards distributive justice and an equity approach in solving the matter at hand. Now, let's look at some parallels of COVID cases. The following cases are presented is to emphasize in regards to unequal treatment and severity of the offense. The first one, the restaurant example relates to unequal treatment. The case where a restaurant owner was fined 2,000 ringgit for allegedly op operating past permitted hours, despite explaining that eatery was closed for the day. In a similar way, police officer A could use his discretion 
under exceptional circumstances since law is not meant to punish and abuse the public as attended by us uh, due to the COVID situation. Authorities should be more mindful and considerate when executing their duties. The second example is to showcase how certain cases do not reflect sometimes with the gravity of the offence. And the most popular one that we would like to show is Nilofa along with her husband only having to pay a total accumulation of 60,000 60, ringgit for breaching SOPs relating to wedding reception and interstate travel. This case is a good example of the size of fine being proportionate to the gravity of the fence. Unlike the burger hawkers case, where the size of 50,000 ringgit is definitely not proportionate, even if we were to compare. Our guideline is drafted in order to combat circumstances in the case study of by drawing analogy to the above examples of real life evidence to prevent any future, any future arbitrary implementation of the legislation, but to ensure just retribution. We want to ensure the public receives equal distributive justice. We assure you that we will strive to make sure everyone is given fair treatment. Therefore, moving forward, we will ensure each police officer approaches each case relating to COVID breaches with empathy and refers to our new guidelines with clearer direction. We also have our police task force together here with us who are key in formulating the guidelines and action plan. They will be responsible for answering any questions from the audience. So please feel free to ask any questions. Is that the end of the presentation? That is the end of the presentation. Okay, so Fatin, is this where we will start asking questions? Yes, yes, Ms. Felicia. Okay, uh, Shark, please uh, feel free to chip in as well. Uh, so Daniel, you, you've talked about the different approaches and I'm, I'm just very curious exactly who are the affected groups again? Who do you think will benefit from this uh, distributive justice system? Uh, perhaps the task force can answer that. Yes, I would like to answer the questions. So basically, the idea of visual justice is to make sure that the amount of compound that we issued is um, is proportionate with the severity of offence. So the affected groups will be everyone who, because we are in the midst of pandemic, so everyone can be affected by the COVID nineteen. So if um, if a burger hawker, for example, um violate the violate the law and we need to understand who are the affected group of these uh, violations of law is it uh, just a normal people in the street or a big organizations so based on our understanding we believe that the the severity of offense under this case study is uh, very limited so that's why we put it under the third category how sure are you that these guidelines will be followed and not be uh, taken advantage of or missed abuse? Uh, I can take that question. Thank you for the question. So um, in our opinion, rather than not having any guidelines at all and leaving it up to the police officer, we're just having a bracket of um, 10,000 to 50,000, you, you are giving the we are giving the police officers too much of discretion and that could lead to more abuse as opposed to having a guideline which um, there is some discretion within our guideline but at least it provides the officers with some structure and also uh, taking into account the fact that we're going to have an audit uh, a bi-weekly or a monthly audit tentatively that would help to ensure there is no abuse thanks team I have uh, one question. Following the guidelines for police officers, how do you come up with interventions uh, necessary to manage the group of police officers that are against um, the distributive justice that you're trying to propose here? Um, I think I'll take that question. Um, that's a very good question. Um, that is why the audit comes um, where the supervisor or uh, someone who is more superior that they will send report to him for a cross check. Um, for like example, we have Dewan Negari and we have Dewan Riot. Dewan Negari used to cross check whatever that is implemented or suggested by the Dewan Riot. So um, in every report or every um, action taken by every each police officers, they will have to report to the um, 
supervisors. Um, that's where the process of audit uh, taken place. Okay. Is it okay if I am to add on to that? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, yes. Prior to coming up to this particular guideline, we, we did engage with crucial parties, crucial stakeholders, those who were involved, including external NGOs, the health department, the public's opinion, as well as most importantly, the uh, police department. So um, it is an idea that we came up collectively, hence um, it would be, I would believe it's safe to say that we wouldn't have that much of backlash to this guideline. Okay, excellent, thank you. Any questions from the other team members? Since we're all in the press conference, right? So anyone can throw in questions. Yeah, press conference. <laughs> Please challenge your team members, teammates. <laughs> um, if I may, uh, can you further elaborate on the compound discount? I did not quite understand that part of your plan. I think I will take the questions. So it's very easy. We believe that the public uh, don't really know the compound discount, but basically when you get, uh, when you receive a compound uh, under the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, so if, if you pay within the seven days of the, uh, of the fine issued, you get 50% discount from the health department. And if you pay within the seven days after the first seven days, you get 25% discount. And after 14 days, you need to pay the full amount of compound. Thank you. Welcome. And just to add to that uh, discount, it's an automatic discount if you pay. So you don't need to make an appeal. So if you pay within seven days, automatically you will get 50% discount. Mm, excuse me? May I? So I would like to ask our uh, group one, uh, based on uh, your first statement just now, uh, I assume that for in your opinion that the police officer B is in the fault because due to uh, due to charging the 50,000 uh, compound to the burger stall, which is in a way uh, unwise uh, considering is their social economic background, true? I will take this question. I wouldn't really say fault. I wouldn't call it a fault directly because um, as of yet, there has not been any guidelines issued. So for the police officer to come up with that cause is based on what he already know of. Hence, this guideline will prevent such, this particular guideline that we are putting forth, it will prevent such occurrence from repeating again. So we like, are preventing such an occurrence, but we wouldn't say it is his fault because there weren't guidelines provided previously. So do you know that uh, in, although the police is the one issuing, but actually it is the, uh, the district health officer that is determining the, the actual amount of fine in the end? I, um, I would like to correct you on that. It is actually the police that issue on the spot. The district health officers will determine only if, we, if they were to appeal for any sort of discount that they want by writing uh, an explanation letter. That is the process. Yes, and right. also thank in you, teams. Thank you so much. But I'm sorry for the interjection, but the time allocated for QA has up. Right. So uh, let us move on with the judges' feedback uh, for five minutes. Uh, Ms. Felicia and Mr. Shah, you may have the floor. All right. I, I thought this is a very interesting case study to begin with. And I kind of struck my mind that uh, we do have a similar case that was uh, that went viral. I don't know how many of you know about it or if you connect this with the Burger Lab story, right? Uh, but in any case, uh, what I like about the presentation is I thought you approach it in a very empathetic, uh, empathetic uh, using an empathetic approach. Uh, you had a very uh, suitable tone of voice as well. Uh, I, I recall the second speaker, Daniel, uh, when I was just hearing you speak, uh, it almost felt like I'm in a real press conference uh, and addressing the issue. Uh, so I thought that was uh, very nicely done. Um, what I thought could be more helpful, especially for a person who may be uh, unfamiliar with the 
the issue uh, is the pace of presentation, uh, especially at the beginning when you presented your problem statement. Uh, I, I found it a bit challenging trying to catch up with what was being presented. Um, and another way of doing it would be perhaps uh, uh, the presentation slide, you know, could also be, uh, you know, in a way helpful as a visual aid to, to present your ideas and your thoughts. So I thought uh, those were just a few things that I've picked up in the presentation. Uh, maybe Shark, you can add on to it. Yeah, so basically you, you spoke my mind already, but I think the, the, the key um, element that you could add perhaps on dealing with the different views that may occur um, within the police department in, in terms of how, how the interventions will be done, whether will it be via cultural transformation or focus group dialogues among the internal department itself. Because I understand there are other stakeholders being consulted, NGOs, but these are external stakeholders. So the focus that I believe, if you can deep dive deeper into the internal stakeholders, that'll be, that'll be better. But all in all, good job to Iqbal, Darshana, Yanru, and Daniel. Did I miss anyone? I hope I didn't miss anyone. Well done. Uh, yes, you do. We have more or more high Oh, okay. <laughs> and to all, to all involved in, in putting this together. Thank you. All right. Thank you, group one. And thank you to the judges. Uh, may I confirm with the judges? Uh, would it be okay to call the next group? All right. Okay, now we. I would like to call out group three. You may have the floor now. Thank you, Ms. Fatin. A very good afternoon, I bid to the Honourable Judges and Chief Timekeeper for the opponents from Group 1 and Group 5 and not forgetting my lovely team members, Mr. Muhammad Farhan, who is in, Ms. Nick Farhana and Loki Weekend. So, my name is Fatin Aja and I'll be acting as the Inspector General. But before proceeding, I would like to take some time to brief on how our presentation will flow today. Firstly, the presentation will be divided into two parts, the press statement and the general requirements irrelevant, uh, that we deem irrelevant to how a press statement will be. The reason behind this is because we would like to keep the press statement as professional as, and as close to reality as possible. And furthermore, based on our research, uh, our press statement will be, basically, uh, most, as, will be based on a situation that already happened in reality, which had been mentioned before by Miss Felicia, Miss Felicia. So, uh, because based on our research, there exists a very similar issue that had happened in the last April. Due to the great similarities, we'll be using that as the situation as our foundation. So, on April to begin, on April twenty fifth at eleven ten p.m., a burger stall in Kelantan was charged a 50,000 ringgit compound due to breaching a few SOPs that had been set for business operation. To clarify this issue, I would like to first clear up the settings of which this incident had taken place. Due to the ever-changing state of law and regulations these days, it is understandable that there could be confusion in regard to the currently effective amendment ordinance. The amendment ordinance Effective March 11, increase the general penalty of an offence under Act 342 to a fine not exceeding an accumulation of 100,000 ringgit or imprisonment for a term not exceeding seven years. The amount for compounding offences will also increase from 1,000 per ringgit per bridge to a maximum of 10,000 ringgit per bridge and 50,000 ringgit for individuals and corporate bodies, respe respectively. The ordinance is applicable in any area, be they in MCO, CMCO, or RMCO. Furthermore, though the police officers issue the compound, they do not have the authority to collect them. Only the district health officers that have the power to determine the value, the final value of the fine according to the situation and types of offenses. Due to this reason, police officers are restricted to issuing the maximum compound amount to offenders as that is what stated within the ordinance. Any adjustment to the compound can be appealed with the district health officers and with their discretion, the amount can be reduced or even waived. It also had to be known that a discount rate system is also in place where the compound amount can be reduced from 25 to 50% of the original, as long as it's paid within two weeks. Having said all that, 
Let's now address the main issue. Due to a report, a police officer visited the burger store at 11.10 p.m. and discovered the business was breaching a few SOPs which were operating beyond the 10 p.m. curfew and failing to provide a body temperature scanner. It was also his second offense in breaching the SOPs for business operations. Though a small business, under the amendment ordinance, the burger store owner was still eligible to be charged 50,000 ringgit for consciously breaching the SOPs. Though seeming excessive, keep in mind that the amount is always negotiable to properly reflect the offence and socio-economic background of the offender, as long as an appeal was made with the district health officers. We understand that due to the current economic situation, many people have their income decreased and some even lost their source. So the final compound amount will definitely reflect uh, these uh, this aspects in consideration. Furthermore, leniency will also be given if paid early enough through the discovery. In reflection of all this, we would like everyone to know that the purpose of compounds aren't necessarily to punish, but to educate people on the importance of an individual in pra practicing collective responsibility in the pandemic situation today. After all, kita jaga kita. So, if an offender shows proper repentance and awareness of his fault, he will certainly be shown leniency when requesting the appeal. Still, in cases of resistant or repeat offenders, stricter and harsher enforcement is certainly due in order to curb behaviors that could risk the health of the surrounding communities. On this matter, the confusion has certainly highlighted the inefficiency of information dissemination in regards to the emergency ordinance. Though gazetted since two, the 25th of February, the constantly occurring regulation had made people unable to keep up with the state of law today. In reaction to this, we decided to address the need for the existence of a more accessible and reputable single source of information. Through consensus, my Sejahtera was decided to be the best platform to publish them. In the future, any changes in relation to SOPs will be made available and updated within the app for everyone's reference. On the app, we will also make the compound allocation guideline transparent in order to protect the people from being excessively charged even after the appeal. Then the idea of advertising the SOPs on TV or local social media ads are also being considered as a method to generate awareness. So with these proposed policies, we hope that any conflicts on the SOPs will cease and all citizens will be informed. Before concluding, we are certainly very concerned and took everyone's opinion on the burger store issue seriously. To avoid such great alarms from, be, from repeating in the future, the authorities had reached a consensus and decided to differentiate the maximum amount compoundable between SMEs and larger business entities. 10,000 ringgit was set as the maximum for SMEs henceforth while the larger operations will be keeping the original amount of 50,000 ringgit. Nevertheless, with all that made clear, we hope everyone will no longer be alarmed on the implementation of the amendment ordinance. We understand your concern and will certainly keep the public updated in regards to the appeal process of the burger store owner. So that's all for the press conference. I will now pass my floor to, the, to Mr. Farhan to continue with the presentation. Thank you, Inspector Patel, for the well-detailed press statement. In regards to the incident, discussions have been made internally, and we believe that this incident reflects that both police officers are not in the wrong and highlights the lack of clear directions on how to approach the situation. However, further discussion will be made to generate awareness among the police officers or patrols on the centralized updated SOP, which will be known to the public as soon as possible. We understand that there will be benefits and shortcomings involved in the aforementioned policies. Hence, we will discuss further on this issue in future meetings. However, some initial initiatives have been made to settle on these shortcomings, such as making the compound allocation guidelines transparent, which will protect the rights of both the offenders and health officers. 
In addition to that, the policies are based on the fact that having digital accessibility will catalyze the spread of awareness on the updated SOPs. However, some common areas such as restaurants and convenience stores in most rural areas do not have access to, to the digital world. Hence, our initial solution to this issue is to distribute printed brochures on the updated SOPs to these common areas by police officers. In conclusion, we hope that this press statement has made clear our stance on this incident and our proposed solution to this issue. We would like to remind all to stay safe and take care of yourself in this, unpre in this unprecedented situation. Follow the SOPs given as part of our cumulative effort to eliminate this pandemic. Thank you for listening and we will now take questions from the floor. Um, it sounds. Oh, sorry, Sharp. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah I think um, was it was clear, just that it would be better perhaps if you could come up with more visuals and graphics to uh, lay out the thought process, the flow. Um, information is there. Um, you know, I raised up earlier about the internal meetings between the police officers, and I'm so glad that I see that point right there. But if more visuals, it will be much better. So more the story lining that can be improved. Yep, that's all. Thank you. So uh, I have a few questions. Uh, first that came to my mind, it, it sounds like you're very confident that this uh, amendment ordinance uh, that has been uh, established is the, is the golden rule already. Um, is that what your team is thinking? And therefore your proposal is, we will need to work on the lack of transparency and creating the awareness. Uh, yes, Ms. Felicia, I'll take your question. Um, it is that the ordinance has already been there, but we believe that this is the ordinance which can be discussed further. But as for now, the key is the transparency for all public have access to the ordinance that it is being published right now and to be more clear and precise. Because what the main issue we are addressing here is that uh, these information are not very clearly disseminated to all the publics. That's why the public might have some very um, backlash from it. that. That is why we are focusing on the transparency of the ordinance here. The fault lies not in the system or the implementation, but the fact that the public uh, didn't isn't aware of this. That's why they are uh, attacking, saying that uh, the police officers are being uh, are treating the offenders cruelly and so on is because they are aware of the um, the negotiate the negotiable uh, nature of the compound itself so are you saying that the it's the public's fault right now for not clearly understanding the ordinance and therefore you know uh creating an unnecessary backlash not at all uh what we mean by that is because the, the issue lies in the dissemination of information and that, that responsibility lies within the government, lies with the authority to properly disseminate the information within the people. So realizing that this, this issue exists and the information wasn't actually properly disseminated in the first place, that's why we are highlighting that there needs to be a proper single source of information that is reliable that people can refer to all the time. They don't need to cross check with newspapers and so on. Uh, so my suggestion will be the best because right now one of the SOP requirement is for everyone to have a my suggestion account. So making it available there will be very more convenient to everyone because it's already like the single source information on COVID already. Um, excuse me, if I may add, uh, we wouldn't actually put the blame on the public because it is clear that um, we are actually to be blamed because of the lack of dissemination as dissemination of information as stated because we might have not uh, clearly briefed out what um, the real procedures are to the um, head of offices in each district. So that's why there uh, exist these uh, arguments and confusions between um, the subordinates uh, police offices. Yeah, that's why the two officers in the first place had an argument because the information aren't even made aware within the law enforcement themselves. So as the Inspector General of this case, 
how have you resolved the dispute between your two subordinates? As presented with, uh, by Mr. Pahan uh, just now, we, firstly, we will, like, we will clarify to the two subordinates about the current amendment ordinance uh, and how it functions how it functions so that the situation, the conflict between the two will be cleared up. After that, we'll hold a meeting with all of the team of, of the law officers, uh, law enforcers, so that they will be made clear on how to approach this kind of situation later in the future. One of our suggestions will be that once you give a compound, explain to them what, uh, explain to the offenders what can be done after that. They should Appear, make an appeal to the district health officer and tell them this 50,000 or this 10,000 amount isn't fixed, but actually can be negotiable based upon your socioeconomic background, based upon your offenses and so on. It, not only is it negotiable to be reduced, it can even be waived if your situation is serious enough. Thanks, Fatin. Please, uh, anyone else from the team, uh, feel free to also challenge your teammates here. Yes, I have a question. So good evening, everyone. So I'm representing the Berita Harian newspaper. So I have a question for the second team. So how long do you think that the proposed policy can be materialized? That's my question. Thank you. I will take that question. Thank you, um, the reporter from Berita Harian. Uh, we are expecting it to be as quick as possible. And we are seeing that it would be efficient in one week because we understand that at the seriousness of the COVID-19 right now, we do not want to delay any more time as for the clearer SOPs to be implemented and right. to be published. Thank you so much, team. It seems that the time of the Q&A session has been left. Uh, we're going to move on to judge feedback. But before that, kindly I would like to kindly remind every team that the presenter, the format of this presentation is that the pres presenter will not be able to answer during the Q&A session because we want to give the opportunity for every group member to, to raise up their opinion and to give a presentation. That's all I hope it's clear and be noted. Uh, Ms. Felicia and Mr. Sharo, you guys may have the floor for judge feedback. Thank you. Thanks. Shark, would you like to go first? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, this is for the for the same group, right? Yeah, for group three. For group three, yeah. Um, I think the content is there, but um, as as questioned by Iqmal, perhaps what can be improved is if you can, you know, come up with, with a met some metrics. How do you want to measure? Um, so that you know whatever police policies you recommended is successful. Because if you cannot have a measurable metric, then how do you ensure or, or calculate or measure that this is deemed successful, right? Otherwise it will be rhetoric and only qualitative. So if you can, you can come up with some quantitative metrics to measure the success of the policy, that'll be, that'll be good. Uh, I like that you uh, presented your, you started off with your presentation on uh, uh, actually explaining the, the ordinance so clearly that, you know, it's almost undisputable. Um, and I like that you, although it seems very harsh in the beginning, I thought, wow, you know, this group is not going to give any leniency. But as you explained the amendment, it brought to my attention and also my own awareness that it's actually open for appeal and you can negotiate, you know, based on uh, the case. Uh, my concern more into this is how do we ensure the fairness uh, and also how do we identify who are the specific uh, groups that are affected, you know, in the different categories. But otherwise, I thought you were, your team were very calm in taking the Q&A. Uh, I was trying to be a bit nasty but uh, you guys took the took the bullet and you've answered that very nicely. So thank you very much, team. I, I thought that was a very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, team and judges. Uh, may I confirm whether the judges are okay with by calling the next group? Yep, I'm good. All right. So if that's so, uh, calling group number five. The floor is yours. Uh, can I just check 
before, uh, before that the slides can be seen? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, members of the public and media, I'm Inspector General Fatin, representing the Royal Malaysian Malaysia Police, and I have Inspector General Dan, who will give the press statement together with me. We also have Inspector General Ernie, Inspector General Wilson, and Inspector General Harris, who will be answering your questions later on. Well, welcome to our press conference today, where we will be addressing the recent incident concerning the issuance of fine against a hawker store owner. The individual at question was apprehended by members of the Royal Malaysia Police after they were caught preparing food for takeaway past the lock time. We were also notified regarding a disagreement between two of the officers involved as their opinion on the situation was divided. We will provide more information regarding these matters later on. First and foremost, we would like to remind the public that this new order, which has been made under the Emergency Prevention and Control of Infectious Diseases Amendment Ordinance 2021, effective of March 11, 2020, is in place to protect our nation from the rapid transmission of the COVID-19 virus. We are currently living through an unprecedented situation, a viral pandemic that we still struggle to contain, even after a year-long battle. While we understand the frustration of this situation, we must still uphold these laws in defense of the people's health. The Royal Malaysia Police has been working hard over the past year in enforcing the law and maintaining order in our country. And we would like also to thank everyone for their cooperation. As law enforcement, it is our duty to uphold the principles of justice. And justice is not limited solely to legislation, but also includes our obligation to protect the people. The public backlash serves as a critical moment for our legislative system to listen to our citizens and learn. We wish to address the concerns of the public and to remind them that they are at the center of the justice system and that these laws serve them. And these emergency laws were enacted under a situation we as a nation have never been faced with before. Therefore, there have been obstacles and difficulties which we must all overcome together. And our laws are not monolithic and we are grateful for the people's active participation and attention in improving our justice system. Hence, we will be directing everyone to the three key issues we wish to discuss today. As mentioned before, we were notified of a verbal dispute between two of the officers involved in the case, and there was said to be a disagreement on ideals which may have caused concern to the public. We would like to reassure the public that this incident was merely a discussion between two officers, which is a usual part of their duties. There have been no casualties or further escalation escalation on the matter. And after an internal discussion, they have since reached a compromise on the issue. Secondly, let us redirect our attention, attention to the case involving the hawker who was caught selling food after the allotted time. There has been significant media attention on this case, partially due to the action of the hawker posting about this incident on social media. It has since gained traction. As the Inspector General, I am here on behalf of the Royal Malaysia Police to clear up any misconceptions surrounding the incident and to assure the people that we wish to address the concerns of the public in a credible manner. Through this case, we have a better understanding of the concerns that these laws and fines are not reflective of the socio-economic environment and may cause negative societal consequences. We also acknowledge that the decisions we make will affect different com communities making this a crucial conversation. After a period of consideration and thorough discussion, we have decided to propose a new initiative with the help and approval of our lawmakers to achieve a cohesive and comprehensive solution for this concern, which will take into account the voice of the public. With every situation, there are many stakeholders involved. For this instance, we wish to take into account the well-being of other small business owners who may be affected by the incident are receiving negative attention. And at the same time, informal workers who are not covered by work-related social protection, national level legislation, nor certain employment benefits may view this situation as a lack of support from the government and perceive the current law to be unjust and inconsiderate of their economic situation. In addition, there may also be people who have been fined prior to this situation. 
who may find our potential decision unjust as they did not receive the same treatment. And let us not forget Malaysia's amazing essential workers, the doctors, the nurses, the volunteers who have been working hard since the beginning of the pandemic. They may be frustrated at the action of the hawker who, despite his financial situation, is still putting many in danger through his actions by contributing to the transmission of COVID-19. After considering the different opinions of all the stakeholders involved, we have come to believe the solution we have at hand will be the best to address the concerns on disparities in our current system and build a more equitable compromise. In order to prevent future incidents like this from happening again, we will be implementing mandatory internal training sessions for all police officers to undergo. These sessions will focus on de-escalation of arguments between colleagues, using case studies as a guiding example while leading with decision, which require quick judgment, while also educating the officers about the diversity of opinion in regards to law enforcement. The Royal Malaysia Police encourages freedom of thought and appreciates such discussions as the only service to enrich our understanding of laws. Our proposal comes in the form of a three-step process. Firstly, the formation of a committee that includes lawmakers, business owners, workers, experts, for example, economic analysts, and of course, the general public. This committee will set a new guideline on fine criteria and limits for different income brackets. We want a committee that includes a diverse range of voices to, make, to give us a holistic solution. We believe inclusion of different voices will act as a check and balance as well as prevent biases from seeping into the decision-making process. Moreover, following the recommendations put forth by this committee, we wish to implement a system of progressive fines that will hopefully ease the burden of those who are already struggling financially. Under the system, the amount of fines will be proportional to the financial situation of the individual, which will prevent undue burden on those who struggle, while also keeping large companies in line. These income brackets will not simply follow our current tax brackets as there are still large disparities between top and bottom earners in each bracket. Instead, the exact figures of the fine will come from the committee itself. Why do we wish to introduce this new system? In practical terms, there is no advantage to handing out fines that are not feasible. Under the old system, there was the dilemma where those who go into debt because of the fine must resort to seeking additional sources of income. As a result, this will only provide an incentive for breaking the law again. We cannot allow this vicious cycle to plague our people who are already struggling to make ends meet. From a societal standpoint, we should extend our empathy. Every single person is struggling right now, but something as small as making fines more feasible to pay will make a world of difference. To implement this, we will produce a new financial declaration form so we can better understand the financial situation of the individual in question. Background checks will also be concluded on individual and or household income to prevent abuse of this leniency. Lastly, we will also introduce a payment schedule for fine. This schedule will be repartitioned uh, on a monthly basis with minimum payments. The length and minimum payment will be agreed upon between individual and committee. We hope this will aid in easing the financial burden of the offenders, while also increasing the probability of the fine being paid. To circumvent fine dodgers or abuse, there will be a fee leveraged on top of the fine for every payment session missed. We believe this new process will act as a sufficient deterrent to potential law violations while incorporating a more equitable solution. The implementation of strategies, such as the one we just presented, are important in setting a new standard for other legislation in our country. It changes the way we measure equity and equality in our justice system, while setting a positive precedent for other institutions in our country to follow. Malaysia is a young country full of potential, but with development comes growing pains. Like mentioned before, justice is not merely the adherence of laws, it is the practice of ending discrimination in our country together. We are proud to see that our Malaysian people are keen in taking a stand for their beliefs and taking active steps to shape their legislative system. We look forward to fruitful cooperation between all parties involved in promoting equality and equity in our system. Thank you very much for everyone's patience and time. We will now open the floor to receive questions from the audience. I have uh, two questions. Firstly, on the internal training sessions, could you deep dive on what are the topics uh, specifically you will uh, train on? 
for the for the poli police officers uh, and yeah you can answer okay. that first please answer right, that so first. i think i will take that question okay so thank you Sharu. so for the internal training session held by us towards the police officers we will mainly be discussing on ways to de-escalate conflict between uh, police officers as to retain um, as to you know not cause concern towards the public it will involve maybe psychological workshops or uh, other experiences from sharing from experienced police officers it will also include case studies where uh, difficult um, choices were made in the past and we can use on that and add on to reflect on that to make better decisions for the future all right uh, if i may add yeah sure uh, if i may add uh, other qualities that we will be implementing in our uh, course is that our police officers will be equipped with the ability to have empathy in their decision making and also the implementation of teamwork in every step of the way. Thank you. Okay. Um, second question for slide number six, you mentioned general public as one of the committees. Um, how do you define general public? Are they um, NGO or residential heads or you know what are the specific groups you want to put in the general public? Uh, maybe I'll handle this question. All right, so um, for us, the general public is those who are not involved in maybe politics or maybe lawmaking to provide a whole new perspective, just your everyday person who are interested in uh, shaping our legislation, they could be called into to maybe gauge their, to gauge their opinion and perspective on new rules that are to be uh, employed so that they could provide their perspective and then we could work on that and provide inclusivity for all opinions. And since the laws is applied on the general public, their voice actually holds a great importance to us. Okay. So I, I guess the way you want to attract the participation is via roadshow or something like that? Uh, yes, that would be one of the ways. Okay, all right. Thank you. Alicia? So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm curious because you've presented that uh, th between the two of police officers, you've reached a compromise. What do you mean by that? Right. Uh, so I can take this question again. Um, so uh, basically, we had an internal discussion with the police officers, and the fines that were set was fifty thousand for the store hawker, and there were conflicting opinions, as you all know. So in the end, we came up with a compromise as to set the fines to the minimum amount, which is ten thousand, which is as stated as the law, to provide a compromise between both individuals, as you are still issuing a fine but maybe not that much of an amount. So you still achieve the effect of deterring the crowd, but it does not provide leeway as, you know, waiving the fine, which, which could cause potential problems in the future. So in other words, the conclusion is, uh, you still deem that this person has violated the SOP and therefore uh, you will implement the fine. Uh, yes, as the law was stated and yes, we will implement the fine with a minimum amount. Okay. I mean, I like this slide on the slide six where you've highlight your solution implementation. Uh, there are two questions on my mind. One is where are the challenges that you foresee uh, with your implementation? And also what is the duration uh, do you plan for each stages? Uh, I think I'll take that question. Uh, for the challenges in implementing this uh, solution is I think the uh, uh, various opinion of the committee in implementing the law. And therefore it will uh, take quite some time to actually reach a, a holistic agreement between the committee and uh, therefore, we will uh, maybe make some uh, benchmark on the duration so that uh, it will not uh, drag too many times. Thank you. All right. 
Thank you so much, team. Uh, the QA and Q and A session has elapsed, so we may proceed with the judge feedback. I think the Q and A can still happen in the chat box, just for the learning of everyone. Uh, but yes, in the interest of time. We will go on with the feedback. So if I may start this time round, I, I like that you started the presentation by acknowledging that, you know, this is really unprecedented and whatever that we're doing now, you know, will then set the precedents forward. Um, and I like that you highlighted who are the communities that are affected and therefore it makes the solution more relevant because then we can clearly see who are the people who will benefit from your solution. Um, what I thought would be interesting to note is uh, because the whole world is going through this pandemic and I'm sure we can all learn from some of the more advanced countries or countries who have done really well in putting uh, forward their best practice. Uh, so what I was hoping to see in this presentation, apart from the solution, is that if you could actually quote uh, some of the other practices from the countries who have done well and that, you know, we could actually take learnings from them as well instead of reinventing the wheel. And knowing that, you know, when we want to come up with an ideal solution, it takes time. And sometimes time may not be a luxury that we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I like the fact that you have truly displayed a clear problem statement, key issues, um, targeted stakeholders uh, throughout the presentation. But the minor, minor thing that can be improved is perhaps on the detailing out of the information that you pro provided. So try to, to prevent from generalizing your point. So if you probably you say internal training sessions, perhaps in the bracket that can put on what topics, general public in the bracket put who, they, who are they, for example. So try to you know, really trickle down to the bottom. So people who, have no idea what is the document about can just read and oh okay this is for us this is not for them so in that context thank you thank you, right, thank you for that comment yeah thank you fellow judges thank you yeah really appreciate it thank you so much judges uh thank you group five now without further ado we're going to proceed with the last group of the day group seven you may have the floor Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Yen Ling, and together with me, I have Sangita, Sei, and Shashwini. I will be presenting alongside Sangita, while Sei and Shashwini will be taking up for the Q&A session. Moving on, we would like to address a few things beforehand. Firstly, the problem statement. The issue is centered on the DIY in case where a burger hawker is fined 50,000 ringgit due to violating the emergency act and operating his hawker store beyond 10 p.m. The people mostly felt it is unjust and the law should be enforced morally. Next, caveat. Our presentation will be based on a few things. Firstly, we made our decisions based on a past incident where the burger hawker has been fined 1,000 ringgit before the emergency ordinance 2021. He also had violated the standard operating procedure by setting up tables for customers and failing to provide a body temperature scanner. We also will be basing on the time setting when the controversy arise about 26 April 2021. This means Dr. Sri Takiyudin Hassan press conference stating only a maximum penalty amount of 10,000 ringgit for accident business hours has not taken place yet. As inspector generals of police, we faced a situation where we had two police officers arguing with each other pertaining to the issuance of a fine made by one of them. Let's call him police, police officer A. Meanwhile, police officer B disagree with it. As she thinks as police officer, we should uphold the law morally. First and foremost, we would like to acknowledge that conflicts in the police station among police officers are very common. We actually to extend welcome conflicts because we think it represents the care of our police officer have to uh, have for their line of work. We appreciate both of the police officer and others for debating on the matter. Who do you lean more towards is a hard question for us because both of them have their points. This is why we also 
uh, always ensure working together in justify any issue, not only based on the issue at stake, but also in terms of how we provide a better environment for the people and enforce law morally in the future. Looking ahead has built the foundation for us to carry out our responsibilities better. When it comes to law that allow description, like the Emergency Ordinance 2021, we have made guidelines on fines for those who violate the SOP to avoid inconsistency in fines. This will allow for uniformity in our line of works and fairness can be upheld. Now, I will pass on to IGB Saketa to carry out the press statement to further deliberate on the matter and also we encourage all of you to scan the QR code for the press release statement. Thank you, IGB Yanling. Good evening to the members of the Zoom hall, the fellow people from the media and not to forget the Malaysians that are at home and my fellow IGBs here with me, IGB Yanling, IGB Sri and IGB Sashwini. The, the Royal Malaysia Police, RMP, would like to clarify matters regarding the 50,000 fine issued to a burger hawker for operating his burger stall after 10 p.m. in accordance with the Emergency Prevention and Control of Infectious Diseases Act Amendment Ordinance 2021. Under the Emergency Ordinance, it is stated that a compound of 10,000 ringgit can be given to any individual who commits an offence. Under this Act and is prosecuted, the individual may be liable for a fine not exceeding 100,000 ringgit or to imprisonment for a term not exceeding seven years or both. Let us now take a quick rundown of the issue. On the 25th of April 2021, during the police patrol, after 10 p.m., a burger hawker was still found operating his burger stall at 11 p.m. He has been warned previously and also have been fined 1,000 ringgit before for not complying to the standard operating procedures SOP. As it was, it's not his first time, the police officers fined him 50,000 ringgit. As we all know, the burger hawker exercised his freedom of speech to express his frustration and before we know it, the, his post on Facebook went viral and the people were vocal about the issue. Almost all, if not most, Malay, most of the Malaysians were unhappy with the decision of our police officers. At the end of the day, we police officers are also part of the community. We are also Malaysians. Back at the police station, we did have a conflict between our police officers pertaining to the issue. One of the police officer, police officer B, who wished to not be named in particular, was at the stance as the people. She was unhappy with the issuance of the fine. She felt that the fine was too hefty to pay during these hard times. Not only it is a high price to pay, but it's also it has a detrimental effect to him and his family, which could lead to other issues like in the future, like deterioration in mental health and tendency to be involved in illegal trades to pay off the fine. Police officer A, on the other hand, issued the burger hawker a hefty fine under a few bases, particularly with the people in mind. He believed that his act could lead to a further spreading of COVID-19. Since as the SOPs are formulated to combat COVID-19, he believed that the Burger Hawker is taking the virus lightly and brushing aside the seriousness of the effect of the pandemic since this is not his first time to violate the Emergency Act. Also, 50,000 ringgit is not close to the value of his potential life loss and health hazard for him and his family and for the people who visit his stall if they were to contract the virus due to his act. While other Malaysians are abiding to the SOPs during this hard time, we believe the Burger Hawker is no exception to the law and it is duly responsibility to get back to the, to get people to abide the SOPs as a nation so we can get rid of COVID-19 and get back to the norm. Or at least do not let the daily cases of COVID-19 to spread higher than about 6,000 cases like back in 29 January, 2021, as you cannot imagine what it will be like to have the daily cases to pick up to an unimaginable 10,000 cases a day. Hence, we discussed the matters deliberately for hours, and after further deliberation, the RMP has decided to stick to issuing the burger or hawker a fine of 50,000 ringgit. This is because the burger hawker has been given several warnings beforehand, and it was not his first time operating his burger stall past 10 p.m. Operating at 11 p.m. is beyond unacceptable. At RMP, we assure everyone that it is indeed that we are working for the people, for the Malaysians at the end of the day. To us, his actions may lead to a detrimental effect to the community, particularly to those that are in contact with him. This includes himself and his family. I would like to also reinstate that their lives worth more than 50,000 ringgit to us. Also, I think this is a great opportunity for us to highlight 
how serious we are taking the pandemic and also hope it will be a good awareness for the fellow Malaysians. I would also like to take this, op this opportunity to emphasize that police, of as police officers, our responsibility has always been in serving Malaysians and enforcing the law. We are also taking measures in ensuring our service for the people is always fair and consistent regardless of our social background, be it family members or politicians, celebrities or men on the street. No one is an exception to the law. In order to ensure our service, particularly pertaining to the fines emergency ordinance, since the law allows discretion, we will be following a guideline that will be finalized with the legislative body and briefed to all police officers. As enforcers, we do not have the right to make the laws of this country. However, the issue has been highlighted to the Home Minister and the ministers in the Prime Minister office, and further deliberations on the issue will be addressed soon. Moving forward to the hawker, you can choose to file an appeal to the Health Ministry for a reduction in the amount of fine issued. As for all police officers under the flag of Royal Malaysia Police, we will be strictly adhering to the laws and guidelines and providing the best service we can for the nation. As for Malaysians, stay home and stay safe and only travel when it's necessary. Please, and also please comply to the SOPs. That's all from me, thank you. I'll be now passing the floor to for questions from the media from IG, and IGB Say and IGB Shashwini will be answering them. I don't think this is fair. You know, this guy is just trying to make a living and uh, he has not violated any major uh, SOPs. And, uh, you know, this is going to only get worse with the public. What are your, um, you know, what are your explanations to that? A prior announcement has been made that business operating hours is should be within 10 p.m. So it's his responsibility to have his, uh, to receive his last order by 9.30 so that he can prepare the food and then he can wrap up his business how business by 10 pm and what people are uh, people are unsatisfied and angry that he has been fined such a hefty amount but what if a new cluster has been established uh, just because people are gathering uh, at the business premises and so on so people should think that government's actions has intention behind it the bigger fines has an intention that it can act as a lesson where we haven't won the battle against COVID yet. It is still far from over. So it sets a reminder to people that compliance of SOP is still very essential. But this poor guy is only operating in front of his home and it's not like he's uh, you know, having a huge crowd. And uh, plus at that time when uh, the officers came, uh, he was just also about to close his store. So, so why are we taking such a, you know, heavy punishment on this uh, particular hawker store? Uh, it's not his first time and it, it, it's a repetitive act of offending. Plus, uh, he can still make an appeal at the district health officer and if he's still unsatisfied, he can proceed with magistrate. So this is not the final amount imposed on him. Um, the RMP, Royal Malaysian Police, are not uh, having the authority to impose the final amount of fine. It is on the hands of district health officer or state health director. Okay, thanks. Hello. Um, given that you've decided to impose this fine, um, how would you come about to dealing with entrepreneurs' organizations or certain focus groups who will definitely protest against this decision. Okay, thank you for the question. So um, for those um, particular group, okay, so basically like um, it's already stated, like there's already given like rules and like it's not exactly rules, like um, the time period for you to operate your business hours. So it's already stated, so you need to follow it and cannot be operating like over hours. So everything need to be run smoothly and do not because like, we know like some businesses having like financial crisis, they need to operate their business to generate their money, but they need to respect also the guidelines given, the, the working hours given because we don't want them to exceed it. And if they exceed the given hours for business, they will 
will be fine be, uh, based on the the action that they did because they are basically taking risk because they already know about it. So why would they take the risk? Like yes, they will. Uh, like there will be some group of people that might be protesting because of the some of the fines that were given. But then uh, it's like a fairly reminder to them that this is serious. So we we don't simply give like a big amount of fines when it comes to like dealing with the such offense. But it just acts as a reminder how serious we take it. And like um like previously said, this is not a final amount. So you can appeal for discounts and what's not. So like yeah, instead of taking it to social media. Okay, we we uh, we go back to the social media instead of taking the angle to social media and make it viral. So, uh, the person should settle it, uh, professionally and through the right, the right direction and not just um make, uh, make emotional take over control him. So yeah, that's it. All right, I give the opportunity to the floor to 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 ask some questions. Um, I think I'll just ask a very short question. Um, the SOPs of timing itself is questionable. Um, when it was Ramadan, it was open to 12. Um, before this, it was open 8 to 8, and now it's 6 to 10. Um, it seems like the SOP of timing or the curfew itself, it doesn't really efficient. So um, is it worthy to, to blame uh, the, the burger hawker for 50,000 by exceeding the time, even the SOP for the timing itself is questionable. Thank you. Amendments to the SOPs are done to help people because some are claiming that they, they lost a lot of profit uh, because since the business hour is limited to 8 p.m. or 6 p.m. So any amendments to the SOP is to uh, help the people financially, uh, socially, as well also pre protect them from the COVID transmission. But uh, pertaining to your question, every announcement are made in the news from time to time. So they should be certainly uh, informative and taken into consideration the updates from news uh, from re reliable sources. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Team 7. It seems that our Q&A session has elapsed. Uh, so we may proceed to the judge feedback. Okay. Uh, Fatin, would you want to allow maybe one more question? I think this round, there are many hands that went up and I thought it's an interesting topic to discuss. <laughs> All right, sure. I mean, if the judges yeah. is fine with it, we can accept one last question. <laughs> okay, very oh. short question. Okay, okay. go yeah. ahead. Like. Okay. So, um, so whether or not it's a, a okay, so from the information I've read from my case study, perhaps it's wrong or right. Um, whether or not it's a, he is a first offender, second offender, third offender, may not, we may not know. However, the police officer, from what I read, he uh, gave a fine based from a complaint. So I'm asking whether or not we should, or police officers should be uh, given authority to give imposed fines based on complaints instead of actual, you know, perhaps looking at the evidence itself or, you know, visual observation of what's happening. Shouldn't, is, doesn't that uh, create a bad precedence, perhaps? I deny the fact that uh, police are acting upon the complaints. Actually, we, uh, Ministry of Health has set the offender registry in collaboration of Royal Malaysian Police. And we recorded every violation of SOB in the system uh, so that district health officers can identify and distinguish between the first time offenders and the repetitive act of offenders so that they can give discounts accordingly. So. Uh, we are not acting upon complaints. We are acting upon the what record says. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Maybe I just uh, quickly go first with uh, my comments. I thought the team started very nicely with a uh, with storytelling of how the whole incident has taken place, and that was a very nice way of setting the background. Uh, the, what was interesting also, you had a QR code <laughs> for your press uh, release, so that was interesting. Um, I know sometimes we just have to put our foot down on certain decision and uh, where you want to go hard on, an, you know, on the, whether it is on a guideline or law or, or whatever, you know, that you're trying to put in place. 
I think it, it also takes credit for like the police officers. You know, we have heard of uh, many recent news of how they have also acted with good deeds and how they've used their judgment in terms of uh, making sure that fair decision is uh, being applied. So I think if that had come out in the press conference, uh, it would soften the tone and really help people to focus on the bigger picture of why we're doing what we're doing instead of going straight into you know, this is it, this is the law, you just have to follow it, no question asked. I thought that part, you know, could have come out a bit more from the team. Yeah, but otherwise, good attempt. Thank you. Yeah, first of all, well done. Um, I like the idea of having the QR code and have that mock statement. Um, that's just another level of effort. But I truly understand from your point of view, sometimes, you know, if you are a leader, um, it's not your job to make everyone happy. Sometimes making the right decision, meaning just having to make the right decision, right? It's, it, it's impossible to satisfy 32 million Malaysians' opinions. But um, to echo Felicia, if you could you know, come up with words, play with the words a bit to soften the tone, that would be much better to be seen as more diplomatic uh, in that way. But all in all, great work and well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, team and judges. So it seems that we come to an end to our today's session. So I believe all the teams have done brilliantly in come out with the solution to this study case. And, and thank you so much for our judges today. Ms. Felicia and Mr. Shak Sharov for such insightful and constructive feedback to all the participants. So in order for us to keep this momentous event, we will, I would like to pass the floor to Amanda, our photographer, to take our group photo in the photo session. Right, Amanda? I'm sorry, I got disconnected. Uh, can I take the picture? <laughs> I'm smiling because there are three pages. Okay, Dan, thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Amanda. And once again, thank you to the judges and to all the participants. So I would like to inform that uh, the judges and the participants, you may kindly leave the room and go back to the main room as we all going to have a big group pictures with the rest of the judges, with the rest of group. All right. So thank you so much for your time and contribution. Uh, wish you all the best and see you soon at the main room. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Do I stop the recording here? Yes. You can you can stop recording.